Right. Hey there, have you ever felt like something's missing in your life? Do you feel like something's missing maybe in the health aspect of your life? Something's missing maybe in the relationship aspect, like maybe you're not getting along with your husband, you're not getting along with your wife, you're not getting along with your children, you're not getting along with your parents, your sister, your brother, the people you work with, or do you feel like something's missing in the financial aspect of your life? Today I wanna to talk to you about the greatest transformation in your life. And you know, you know what's really interesting? The things that call our attention to the need for transformation are generally speaking external things. And because the things that call, what do I mean, what do I mean the things that call our attention to the need for transformation are generally external things. What I mean by that is, is I will look at myself in the mirror and I'll think, oh, dude, when did you let that happen, right? And then so, and so I'll say, I don't like the way I look, so I'm gonna start working out. And so the external vision of me seeing what I look like and not liking that made me go, uh -uh, we ain't doing that no more, we're gonna do something different, right? Or, or maybe, maybe you have a conversation with somebody that you love and it wasn't a pleasant conversation. You're like, oh, that was really not fun. I don't want that anymore. I, something's got to change, right? Or, or maybe you, you looked at your money at the end of the month and you realized you had way more month left at the end of the money than you had money at the end of the month. And you said, I'm tired of living like this, right? And so, so you make a decision based on some external circumstance. The problem with that is when you attempt to fix it, you attempt to fix it by external means and external means won't fix external circumstance because the circumstance that's on the outside is the symptom of the problem. It is not the problem. It's almost never the problem. Like people say, well, um, I'm overweight. Well, that might be a symptom of the problem, but that's not the problem. Uh, well, I'm broke. Well, that might be the symptom of the problem. That monitor went out, by the way. That might be a symptom of the problem, but that's not the problem. Um, um, oh man, me and my wife argue all the time. That's, that's a symptom of the problem. That's not the problem. The problems that show up outside of us, the, like the, the, the stuff that shows up outside of us and feels like a problem is never the problem. The problem is something going on inside of us. And so I'm gonna show you today from the scriptures how to have the greatest transformation in your life. In what area? Any area you want it in. So, one of my favorite verses, passages of scripture, Romans chapter 11, um, starting with verse 33, reading down to verse number, uh, chapter 12, verse number two, here's what it says. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, his judgments, his decrees. God has decreed his judgments. He doesn't have to think about whether or not something's okay. He doesn't have to think about whether or not something's right or wrong. He's already declared his judgments. His judgments are what they are, right? Okay. Um, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. What does that remind you of? Does that remind you of Isaiah 55, where it says, my ways are not your ways, saith the Lord, and neither are my thoughts your thoughts, whereas the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God has a higher, better way of doing things than we do, okay? His, so they're past finding out. Verse 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again for of him, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom glory, to whom be glory forever, amen. That tells us about the purpose of life. Does that remind you of Revelation chapter four, verse 11? which tells the purpose, the purpose for everything in existence. Everything in existence exists for the same reason. And we see the reason, the, ex the reason for the existential nature of life is Revelation 4.11. For thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Why? Because God is pleased. That's why he made it. So if you're not seeking to please God in your life, you're missing the whole point of you being here. If I'm not seeking to please God with my life, I'm missing the whole point of me being here. If I'm looking out, if I'm seeking to please me, I, I blew it. I fumbled on the one yard line. How's that for a football reference for a person who's only seen one professional football game his whole life? Okay, so, 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 God's glory is the purpose for everything. Okay, then it says, I beseech you, Romans chapter 12, verse one, I beseech you therefore, brethren, what is, whenever there's a therefore or a wherefore, there has to be a what? A before. So he's saying, because of these things I just told you, because his wisdom and his knowledge and his judgments and his ways are past finding out, because 
that he does everything for his glory and he's worthy of that glory. Because of that, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, which means sanctified, set apart, special, holy, and acceptable to God. Not acceptable to you, not acceptable to me, not acceptable to other people, but what do, what do people want to think? It doesn't matter. It's supposed to be acceptable to God. That's your reasonable service. And then it says, and be not conformed. Conform means to be fashioned after the likeness of something. It has the idea of a cookie cutter. What is a cookie cutter? It's something that we use on the outside and we press it down with pressure from the outside to make it in the shape of the thing that we're pressing down on it with. The scripture says, be not conformed to the world. That word world is not the earth. It's not the ball, the, the planet that we're on. That's not what it's talking about. It's not the earth. It's not, it's not the dirt. It's not even the cosmos. It's talking about the age. Don't be conformed to the age, to the era. Don't let the era in which you are in shape you in its form. Don't let you make it like, you, like it. That's what we do today, right? So the world says it's okay, so it's okay. Uh, it, it's amazing. Like, it, it, it's, what blows my mind is that people think that because somebody's a celebrity that that makes them somehow smarter. Well, my observation has been almost to a fault that it's the exact opposite. <laughs> right? And so, I mean, like Oprah Winfrey, for instance. And I, 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 I think Oprah's done a lot of good for a lot of people. And I think in some ways she's a great example. But in some ways she's a horrible person. How can I say that? Because she has enough nerve because she's Oprah and she owns the letter of the alphabet now, so now she can challenge God. Well, surely God can't. No, be careful. If you're going to say something other than, when you say God can't, if you're going to say something other than lie, you lie. Because the only thing God said God can't do is lie. Well, God, surely God, surely you can't believe that Jesus is the only, surely I can, surely I do, and surely I will, is what it says in the Bible. I get it. Everybody doesn't believe the Bible. Do you? you don't, everybody, I shouldn't even say everybody doesn't believe the Bible. Here's what I'm going to say. Everybody doesn't believe the Bible yet. You know, it's like, it's like children growing up in their parents' home, right? Where food grows in the refrigerator, right? <laughs> farm, what's the farm? That's where they grow the food. You mean it don't grow in there? No, it don't grow in there. I put it in there, okay, right? So it, and, and it's like children, when they become teenagers, they want to challenge their parents because they're, they're feeling their, you know, whatever, my, my manhood or their womanhood. And they want to challenge their parents. It's easy for you to have an opinion. I've been blocking for you your whole life. You couldn't even hold your own head when you got here. Quit tripping. Okay. But so now we get to the point in our lives where we start feeling like so self-assured and so self-made that we can challenge our creator. Danger, Will Robinson, danger. Okay. I got a little amped. Got a little excited. I, beside, I beseech you. I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God. What is the mercy of God? I want you to think about this. People say, what kind of God would let, the kind of God that don't answer to you? Whatever the rest of your question is. I, I, I can't believe in a God, oh no, you can only believe in a God of your imagination, the one you make up. But you made him up, how good could he be? Look at your life. You made him up. I can't believe in a God that I could make up. I can't believe in a God that would do what I say. <laughs> like, ooh, that, that would be pretty scary. <laughs> are, you, are you kidding? Are you messing with me right now? I can't believe that a God who loves people would let so much war be in the world. Really? First of all, let me help you understand something. Man severed the relationship with God. God didn't sever the relationship with man. Let's start there. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Let's start there. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Let's start there. Can, can we start with that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. The good stuff we do is not even good stuff. Because a lot of times we're doing it for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. I wish I had some help in here. And, and, and so what happens is we, 
we, we go through life and we don't understand the mercies of God. Here's the mercy of God. Okay, grace is when I receive a gift that I don't deserve. That's grace. What's that? Talk to me, everybody. What is it? Grace. Mercy is when I don't receive judgment that I do deserve. What's mercy? I mean, what is that? Mercy. What, I don't receive judgment I do deserve. That's mercy. He said, because of what I just said, I'm begging you by the mercies of God, the fact that he hasn't obliterated you already, I'm begging you for that reason. Present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Some people don't like the fact that the Bible says that God doesn't love everybody. Some people, that, that's really, that really rubs people the wrong way, especially, especially churchianity folk. No, God loves everybody. That ain't what the Bible says. Go read Romans chapter nine and tell me God loves everybody. You're allowed to hate somebody, but God's not allowed to. God deserve like all of us deserve to be hated by God. Let's start there. God doesn't have a good reason for loving any of us. So because he loves some and doesn't love others, that makes him worse? I don't think so. In fact, I submit to you, even though this is not what I'm even going to talk about yet today, that if God loved everybody, his love would be worthless. If there's no capacity for hate, love's not love, it's just default. Did I say that too fast? If, if there is no capacity for hate, love is not love, it is just default. <laughs> Can you imagine? Go home, ask your wife, baby, you love me? And she says, I just love men. That is not what you were looking for. <laughs> say to your husband, baby, you love me? I just love women. I think women are amazing. Bruh, wrong answer. The thing that makes your spouse's love valuable is that it's yours. It's not everybody's. I beg you by the mercies of God, because God has been merciful to you, I beg you that you present. By the way, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren. This is talking to believers. Those who have been redeemed, you've already received the mercy of eternal life. You've already received it. It's not something you receive later. You've already received it. You say, what do you mean you've already received it? Whosoever believeth in me shall never die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You've already received the eternal life. Death is just a continuation of life for the believer. Okay. He said, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He said, because of God's mercy, because Christ died for you, live for him, it's reasonable. It's reasonable. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. I beseech you, I mean, it says, um, um, the love of Christ constraineth us. It holds us together because we thus judge that if one died for all, then they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What does that mean? That means because Christ died for me, I, I am supposed to live for him. Okay. And then he says, so, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here it comes. The way the transformation happens is by renewing your mind. Be not conformed. You're presenting your body, you're sacrificing your body as a living sacrifice. How? By renewing your mind. Letting your mind, getting your idea of the way things should be from the word and not from the world. I did a YouTube video um, called Get the L Out of Your Mind. Because when you take the letter L out of the word world, it becomes the word word. And most people who should be fashioning their lives after the word are fashioning their lives after the world. You should go watch that video. It's really good. Okay. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I'm going to make some assertions here. God, the God that made you has a plan for your life. The world system, the age in which we live also has a plan for your life. You are going to yield to one of those plans. You might as well yield to the one that has your best interest in mind. See, 
the world system wants to make you a copy of 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 a copy. What do you get when you get a copy of 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 a copy? What do you get? Here's what you get. Something that's unreadable and unrecognizable. And that's how what most people's lives are. They're not what they're supposed to be. They're not what they could be. They're not what they were, but they're not even what they are. They're just a copy of 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 a copy. Do you understand God is the ultimate original? And when he made you, he made you an original from an original. He didn't even make you a copy of an original. He made you an original of an original. Mm, Part of my brain just melted, leaked down in my eye. He made you an original of an original. God put a different aspect of his creativity inside of each of us. And he didn't put the same aspect of his creativity inside of any of us. I've got six brothers. None of us are the same. We're all the same. We all look a little bit like James and Carolyn, right? We all act a little bit like James and Carolyn. We all like some of the stuff they like and don't like some of the stuff they like and don't, but we're all different. Six brothers, we're all different. My children, they're different. They're way different than me. Both of them are way different than me. They're different than the mama. Why? Because God didn't make you a copy of a copy. God made you an original of an original. Why would you, why would you want to, why would you want to live and die as a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy? That's gotta be a painful existence. You're, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna get in where you can fit in and sign the banana and be one of the bunch and join the gang? No, just be yourself and let the chips fall where, hey, let them fall where they may. So, how do we have this transformation? Well, the first thing we have to do, is we have to get an idea about what the purpose of our life is in the first place. And I already said, the purpose of our life is to please God. It's really interesting that people make the mistake of thinking that the Bible is a book about religion. Don't make the mistake, you two. The Bible is not a book about religion. The Bible is a book that contains religion, but it's not a book about religion. The Bible is a book about a king and a kingdom and a royal family and the culturalization of a foreign land, that foreign land is called earth. And the whole Bible is about expanding heavenly culture to earthly realm. And if every human being on earth became obsessed with that objective, all of the social ills in the world would go away in one day. The Bible's not a book about religion, it's a book about government. The first five books are called the Torah. They're called the Torah, right? And the Torah is the what? It's the law. Are laws religious or are they governmental? They're governmental. God is a king. Jesus is a religious, he's not a religious figure, he's a governmental figure. He's the king of kings, the king of all kings. He's the king of King Myron, he's the king of King Ryan, he's the king of King Mark, he's the king of King Lee, he's the king of King Tom. He's a king who when you yield to him, he will make you the king of your thing. And when you yield to him, ladies, he will make you the queen of your scene. God is a king who wants to make you a king or a queen. Satan is a fake king who wants to make you a slave, ride you hard until you die. Understand the objectives. So when I understand the purpose of life, I understand the objective of life. The objective of my life is to please God. And because, how is God pleased? God is pleased when I represent him. How do I represent him? Well, by being like him. Well, how can I be like him? Well, what's the first thing he ever told us about himself? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So when I'm creating something, I am being more like God. So I am pleasing God when I'm creating. But God said, when he made everything that he made in Genesis chapter one, he said, and God said, here's what it says over and over. Go read Genesis chapter one. God said, and it was so, and God saw that it was good. God said it was so, and God saw it was good. So when God says something and it's so, God sees that it's good. So God made all this stuff and said it was good. He made one thing and he said, That ain't good. What was it? It is not good for man to be alone. So God created us for creation, but he didn't just create us for creation. He created us for creation, but he also created us for connection. How did God know it wasn't good for man to be alone? Well, because he's God and he knows everything. I get that. But what's the other reason? 
God knows it's not good for man to be alone because God knew it wasn't good for God to be alone and man has made the image of God. So God made man a companion called a wife and together they could populate the earth so we would all have companions. When, specifically speaking, when God said it's not good for a man to be alone, it was talking about a man having a wife. In general, when God said it's not good for a man to be alone, he was talking about humans need humans. You don't think you need humans? If you, were, if you were the only person left on earth, everybody else on earth was obliterated, you were the only person left, you'd be the richest person in the world and you'd be miserable. Why? Because you'd have to be the farmer who grows the food. You'd have to be the packer who packs the food. You'd have to be the person who delivers the, pack, the food to the store, who delivers the food, and the person who owns the store, who, who stocks the food. And then you'd go be the customer who buys the food and the cashier who checks out the person who's buying the food. And that's just food. We ain't even talked about gas. We ain't talking about building houses. We ain't talking about car. People need people. That's why people, it's, easy, it's one of the reasons why it's easier to create wealth in a city than it is to create wealth in a country, in the country, out in the rural areas. Why? There are more people. There are more people to serve. When there are more people to serve, there are more people who can pay you for the value you deliver to them at that level. Are y'all tracking? Okay. So, I'm supposed to not be conformed. Don't let the world make me like the world with pressure. Hey, so, so I'm going to get really specific here, okay? Parents, don't let the cultural hypnotic societal mechanism, don't let the miseducational misdirectional system and the other people who had their children in that system, don't let them peer pressure you in to thinking that your children are stupid because they can't learn the way the system pseudo teaches. That too tough? Like I knew I was smart. This F that I got, those Fs didn't mean I wasn't smart. It just meant I didn't like school. <laughs> like they should have gave the school an F. I deserved at least a C for my creativity. <laughs> I'm just saying, what they giving me? Y'all giving me an F for y'all? The one didn't teach me. Y'all the one getting paid? Why are you tripping? Okay. So, and by the way, when my children were small, oh no, I was not helping the. And my children went to Christian school. I'm not. Letting, I'm not helping y'all beat up on my kids about the, your, to help you validate your degree. Quit tripping. My child is not stupid because you a bad teacher. Mr. Gone, you're starting to get his homework done. It ain't homework. Quit tripping. Schoolwork. Y'all didn't finish teaching them at school. I'm paying y'all. Do your job. Don't expect me to do your job when they come home. Did you tell them that? Just like that, with that much attitude. Just like that. And I told the principal one day, if you don't want me to send my son to school with a backpack full of dishes they didn't get washed last night, stop sending all this junk to my house. We got stuff we want to do. We got a family. We want to do stuff together. My son comes home, works on so-called homework for six hours, memorizing a bunch of stuff he'll never use in his life, and you want me to think I'm not a bad parent because I won't go back and relearn it to waste. Now you're going to waste their time and my time? You are some kind of out your mind. And yes, I have an attitude about it. I, I, I didn't want you to miss it. Uh, so, so understand, understand you, ha stop, just stop letting the world system pressure you into making your children feel stupid or less than. Don't do that. One of the parents' jobs, your job as a parent is to make your children feel smart and to make them feel safe and to make them feel loved and to make them feel honored and to guide them in the direction of their giftedness, not, your, not their teacher's giftedness. I'm saving somebody's child's life with this message right now. Schools put so much pressure, schools and parents put so much pressure on their children to validate the teacher's degree. And that's what I believe the whole emphasis. Well, I'm a teacher. I went to school. I'm, I'm right. Well, you go be right by yourself and leave my child alone. Okay. One, okay. I'll, I'll, get, I'll do a Bible study on that later. But right now, right now. If you want to tr change the output of anything, you got to change the input. The, the way you change the output is not by using the same input you've been using and trying harder. Trying harder is not the formula for success. It's the formula for exhaustion. You, uh, this isn't working, so I'm going to try harder. 
maybe we should come get your family and take them to safety. That does not make sense. This isn't working, I'm going to try harder. No, this isn't working, I'm going to learn a new skill. This isn't working, I'm gonna develop a new ability. We have to be transformed, how? By renewing our mind. Now, here's what's really interesting. The word renew is the same word as the word renovation. If you've never renovated anything, you really can't appreciate the significance of this passage. Because the word renovate means to tear out the old, clean up the mess, and put in the new. When we were renovating this building, it was a disaster. We had plaster and dust everywhere. Why? You got to rip out a bunch of old stuff. There were four offices right along this. <laughs> they gone now. <laughs> right? You got to tear out some stuff. Do you understand? There's, there are some ideologies, some beliefs that your grandmother and your grandfather and your mother and your dad and your aunts and your uncles and your siblings and your teachers and your bosses and your coworkers have installed in you that are not serving you and you haven't even examined those thoughts and what they're doing in your life. It's amazing. It's amazing. Don't be made with, don't be made like the world, like the, like the current age with pressure from the outside. Be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind, the inside. Tear out those old thoughts that don't line up with scripture. Tear out those old thoughts that don't line up with the direction you desire your life to go in. Okay, so. Um, when <laughs> So when I was growing up, my dad smoked. My mom smoked too for a little while. So children want to be like their parents. I wanted to smoke. People always laugh when I say I quit drinking when I was 11. But I'm serious. I quit drinking when I was 11. I gave it up. I'm done. <laughs> Been on the wagon ever since. <laughs> okay. um, and, and, I, and I quit for I quit for a different reason than just I don't like I because I was I was I was drinking beer when I was three and four years old. I was allowed to go get out of the refrigerator and drink it like it was soda. It, it was the culture. It was the, it was, it was the era in which I grew up. I, I could tell you about the roots of that. Maybe one of these days I'll do a video and talk about all the roots of that and how, how the, how the far-reaching tentacles of slavery have impacted the lives of black families in the United States of America with regard to alcohol and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing when you see where it comes from. But it wasn't abnormal at all for me to drink as alcohol as a three-year-old or four-year-old. And I loved going to work with my dad. Strongest man I've ever seen in my life. Like, oblivious to pain. It was like he didn't feel pain. He could cut his finger off with a saw almost and just, boy, give me that tea. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> right? You're going to put electrical tape? Dude, it's not even white, like, it's not even, like, medical tape. It's electrical tape, bro. <laughs> All right, let's go. Aren't you going to the hospital? I ain't got time. Anyway, got tired of the hospital. I'm like, okay. All right. <laughs> I don't know, bro. Maybe there was some tendons or something. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, my dad, toughest guy I ever knew. I love going to work with my dad. And I love building things. My dad loved to build things. I love fixing things. My dad loved to fix things. I loved hammering nails and cutting boards and sweating pipe and all of that, you know, man stuff, right? And I remember one day I was, I was with my dad. We were working on this roof with his friend, Mr. Buck, working on this roof. I'm 11. And I'm just cutting boards, hammering nails, bringing him every tool he asked for, like clockwork. And I hear him bragging to one of his friends. Yeah, man, my son's the hardest worker you've ever seen in your life. I thought he was talking about me. I'm right there with him. I'm, I got six brothers. I'm the only one there. And then, yeah, he said, yeah, that Michael Shore can't work. Boy, he cleans that house better than anybody. I'm like. And then I, he saw me looking at him. He caught me looking at him like. I'm confused. And here's what he said. And that Myron sure can drink some beer. <laughs> My dad's a great, was a great guy. I'm not putting him on Front Street. I'm just, he was a great man. Great man. One of the greatest men I've ever known. And I said to myself, you will never be able to brag on me about that again. Ain't touched it since. Ain't had a can of beer, Mad Dog 2020, Johnny Walker Red, none of it. <laughs> none of it. Cold 45, mm -mm. only 45, I got it. <laughs> anyway. 
It has more to do with calibers and stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you say, Byron, what are you saying? I changed what I thought about it. I'm done. I'm 62. In, as, as the guy who I bought a piece of medical equipment from said, 62-year-old, moderately athletic. <laughs> I wanted to punch him in his head when he said that. How about, how's that for moderate? <laughs> okay, okay. Anyway, he's, he's moderately athletic. I'm like, bro, I, okay, I ain't 33. Okay, anyway, I'm 62. I'm in fairly good shape for a 62-year-old. But I used, to weigh, I used to weigh 225 pounds. That was, that was, that was like 47 pounds more than I weigh right now. Not a lot. But in order for me to change my physical, my physicality, my physical fitness, I wasn't going to do it by using willpower to make myself stop eating all that stuff I love. You know what I had to do? I had to change, use my mind power to stop loving the stuff I loved. I had to figure out, a way, how can I hate the stuff that hates me and love the stuff that loves me? Y'all picking up what I'm putting down? So I changed how I thought about it. So, so um, for instance, I'm, I'm, some of you are not going to like me for doing this, but like the thought, the thought of pork or shrimp or crabs or lobster or something touching my food, just makes me nauseous. The thought of, like not it happening, just thinking about it happening. Just, ugh, just, ugh, it's just... Uh, so disgusting on so many levels. Like, there's, like, oh, oh, yeah, this has bacon in it. You can just take it out. I can't take it out and eat it. When I was a little kid, we, we, were, having a, we were having a cookout. A fly landed on a piece of bread. And then it flew away. My mom tore off the piece of the bread that the fly landed on and threw away. Why'd she do that? I didn't realize how, y'all know what flies do, right? Anybody not know? Anybody not know? Okay, because I can explain it to you. Okay, you don't know? Okay, I'm going to explain it to you. So what flies do, I was hoping there was somebody because I really wanted to explain this, clearly. <laughs> so when a fly lands on something, the way it ingested it, it throws up on it. And then it s sucks that regurgitation back inside of itself so it's pre-digested. So my mom knew that the fly didn't just land on a piece of bread and leave. It left something when it left. It contaminated the food. So this is why if you have a fly in your orange juice, you don't take the fly out and drink the juice. You just throw the juice out. You, you got a fly in your oatmeal. You don't take the fly out and eat the oatmeal. You just throw the oatmeal out, right? Y'all track it. Well, when I learned that a hog is in the animal kingdom, what a fly is in the insect kingdom, I'm done. I'm through. A, fly, a hog, a fly exists for the purpose of removing filth out of the environment. A hog exists for the same reason. A shrimp exists for the same reason. A lobster, same reason. A crab, same reason. They're bottom feeders. They eat the refuse. I could use another word. It starts with P. Ends with P. It has two O's in the middle. I won't say the word. But... <laughs> of other animals. They eat it. They eat it. You take, you, take a, 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 you take a roach, you turn it upside down. You take a shrimp, you turn it upside down. They look exactly the same. One's just bigger. They're the same thing. Like roaches or shrimp. I mean, shrimp or roaches of the sea. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, all I'm, I'm not trying to mess it up for y'all. Some of y'all forget. Well, but, if, but, uh, if I, but if I did mess it up, if I did mess it up for you, congratulations. Now you don't have to eat that mess no more. Okay. So, so, so why am, why am, I, why am I telling you this? Because when you change what you think about something, it changes how you interact with that thing. A person who can't quit smoking, you know what they need to do? They need to go to the cancer ward and go visit some people who have to talk through a tracheotomy because they couldn't quit smoking. Go visit those people and hang out with them and ask them if they wish they were going to live longer and ask them if they wish they could tell their grandchild they love them without sounding like you sound when you talk through a tracheotomy. Right? All you have to do is, like, if you change what, like, if you change, so... If you change how you think about a thing, it requires no willpower whatsoever to stop doing it. You renew your mind. You tear out the old thoughts. Oh, this is so good. You put in some new thoughts. This is really terrible on a lot of levels, right? Um, 
So you renew your mind by taking out old thoughts and putting in new thoughts. Now, so he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies. So you're presenting your body. Your body is a sacrifice. There's a reason our body is down here and our head's up here. Because this is supposed to serve this. This is not supposed to serve this. Are y'all tracking? And what happens when you want your life to end in disaster, let this run this. You capitulate to every appetite this has, you will be dead in short order. It won't take very long. This, needs, this is here to serve this. This is why, so human beings, like animals, lower their head to their food, generally speaking. Human beings, not only do we raise our food to our face, we use utensils to raise our food to our face. Why? It's a picture of the body sacrificing to the head. That's what it's a picture of. It's, it's like the lower part of everything should serve the higher part. We should serve God. Our body should serve our mind. Our mind should serve our spirit, and we should serve God. That's how we do it. That's how we yield. We make sure everything's under authority. Okay, now, if I'm going to transform, here's, here's the problem. Here's the like the very first thing, we, we didn't, when God made man, he didn't need to transform because he was already innocent. So all man had to do was be fruitful and multiply. Be, he had to be fruitful, do multiply, do replenish, do subdue, and then he could have dominion. So here's the problem. When man sinned, this power was, thwart, it was, it was thwarted. The power to be, do, and have was thwarted. We are not as good at being, doing, and having as Adam was. We're not as good at being, doing, and having as Eve was. So here's the problem. It's, it's not even a problem. Here, here's just the way it is. Your desire to have. By the way, how many of you would like to have more strength in your body than you have? Or is it just me? Everybody in here except Andre. Like, I want the strength in my body he has in his. I'm just saying, bro. Every, I literally have to close my eyes when I watch you work out sometimes. But I can't even look. I'm like, surely his arm's going to break off. Okay. And so I, just, I, don't, I close my eyes. Like, and then I peek. <laughs> right. Okay. Anyway. So, so how many of you want, but seriously, how many of you'd like to have more health in your body? How many of you would like your relationship with the people you love to be better? Right. How many of you would like to have more clients who love you more and buy more stuff from you and are happy they bought it? Right. Okay. How many of you would like to have, um, how many of you would like to have, live in a nicer house or drive a nicer car? Right. Okay. Guess what? I'm going to tell you something. Your desire to have nicer and better experiences of life is something God gave you. It is the gift of God. God gave you that desire. So that, so your, this is, it's natural. Your desire to have is natural. But here's the, here's the challenge. We don't have, we don't get to have by trying to have. Trying to have doesn't help us have. What? Anything. I want to have a better relationship. Wanting to have a better relationship won't give you one. Did you hear what I just said? I want to have more health in my body. I want to have more strength. Wanting to have more strength won't give it to you. Are you tracking? Wanting to have more money won't give it to you. See, if you don't like the output, change the input. What's the input? Well, being is the input for doing. Doing is the output. Doing is the input for having. Having is the output. We all want to have this as an output. But it's impossible to have this until we yield to doing whatever's right in order to have it. See, say... Uh, some of you may be wondering, because my wife asked me this question when I first taught this, Myron, but what's the, if it's okay for us to desire a nicer house and a nicer car and nicer clothes and more money and a better health and all, if, if, that, if that's okay, what's the difference between that and covetousness? Because the scripture says clearly, thou shalt not covet. Covetousness is a desire to have something that you have no right to because you either don't have the willingness or the ability to do the thing that causes you to deserve it. A desire to have without a willingness or ability to do is covetousness. That's why you, thou shalt not covet the neighbor, thy neighbor's wife. I can't covet my own wife. She's already my wife. So if I desire my wife, that's not covetousness. That's just, I, I, I took responsibility for being her husband. Are you tracking? Right? If I want more money, me wanting more money is not a bad thing as long as I'm willing to serve some people and give them something they want more than they want their money that they hand over to me. Are you tracking? And so what happens is we are covetous when we want to have more, and, but we're unwilling to do more to have it. And that's where a lot of people are stuck. But some, those of us who are here ain't stuck right there. Oh, I'm willing to, I'm willing to do something different. I'm, I'm willing to do something different. Where are my people? I'll do something different. Right? Okay. 
But here's where you get stuck. In order to do more, you have to become more than you've been being. Because until you become more than you've been being, every time you attempt to do more than you've been doing, you are going to bump your head on your inability. And you're going to stub your toe on your insufficiency. The reason you... The reason you have a lack of ability, a lack, you don't have a lack of capacity, you have a lack of ability. The reason you have a lack of ability is because that's what gives you something to work on. Becoming the person who can do the thing. Uh, we went out to eat last night. My granddaughter is four years old. I have never yet, in all four years of her existence, I have never thrown her to the keys and said, run to Publix and get me some chocolate almond milk. Not once. Why? Does she know what almond milk is? She does. Does she know what Publix is? Probably does. She knows a whole bunch of other stuff. (laughs) The other day, she's so funny. She said something funny, and I laughed. And she turned around and looked at me. She said, (laughs) okay. (laughs) Right? Okay. So, But I don't do that. Why? She's not yet become the person who can do it. It's not that she will never be able to go to Publix and get me some chocolate almond milk. She's just not grown into that person yet. Sometimes the reason you don't have the things you don't have is because if you have them before you become the person who knows how to use them, they will harm you. God is protecting. Your inability is protection from God because you're not yet the person. How many of y'all tracking? And so, so I got to become more. So being speaks to my identity. I don't want my identity to be shaped by the world system. I don't want, I don't, I don't, in my life, I can't afford to work on being who I think other people want me to be. That's almost always a disaster. Here's what it says. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who what? Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. What does that tell us? He, Jesus knew who he was but he didn't need you to know who he was in order for him to know who he was. See, when you need other people to acknowledge and recognize you for your thing, then maybe your thing ain't your thing. You on tracking? Those of you who are watching on Zoom, you may want to jump over to YouTube because they're going to need that in a couple minutes. They're gonna, I, I may keep going, and so you may have to jump over to YouTube. You may want to do that early, just giving you a little head start. So wrap your mind around this. I can't afford to be, try to be a people pleaser because you can't please people anyway. You're wasting all that energy trying to please somebody you can't even please. Okay, so I can't get my identity from the world culture hypnotic societal mechanism. So yeah, I gotta be, I want my identity to come from the ultimate identity. Who's the ultimate identity? The I am that I am. In fact, he's so much the ultimate identity that you can't even tell me who you are until you first tell me who he is. You can't, even if you don't believe in God, you got to introduce me to God before you introduce me to you. If you say, I am an atheist, you told me who God was before you told me who you were. So I want to make sure that I'm yielding my, I'm, I'm not conformed to this world, but I'm renewing my mind and I am being who he says I am. I believe about myself what God believes about me and I can't afford to believe anything else. And so whatever you believe about me, you can tell me or don't tell me. I don't really care anyway. I'm going to just keep on doing it the way he told me to do it, Okay. So, now, being speaks to my identity, doing speaks to my activity. You will never, see, every person is already doing 100% of everything they can do who they are right now. Did you hear what I said? Every human being is already doing 100% of everything they can do who they are right now. So in order for you to do more than you've been doing, you've got to become more than you've been being. That all, being always precedes doing. Okay. So, identity precedes activity. Activity precedes property. Having speaks to our property. That's the part we all want. But guess what? You don't get the property until you do the activity. You don't get to do the activity until you own the identity. You got to change how you see yourself in order for you to do something different than you've been doing. It'll change, change everything. So for me, I'm a, I don't know about y'all. So when it came to my health, I'm a foodie. I like food. What kind of food? All, a whole bunch of kinds. I don't like all kinds. Like, I don't like lima beans. I don't like pork and I don't like shrimp. Y'all get that. But I don't like lima beans. Like, I just, I can't wrap my mind around them. They don't, nothing about them makes sense. Um, but, but I like a lot of food and I like it to taste good. And so, I, so because I'm a foodie, I like to cook. And when I cook some, it's going to taste good. Right? So I like food. So I decided since I like food so much 
the way for me to get myself back in shape is not by dieting. I ain't going to diet because the first three letters of the word diet are diet. Every time I'm on one, I feel like I'm going to die. <laughs> so you know what I do? I just do intermittent fasting. I make the window in which I don't eat bigger than the window in which I do. So I don't eat until noon or, 12 noon or 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and then I stop eating at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. I'm done. And that's the only time I eat. The water and vitamins, only stuff. I, I don't even drink. Like my protein shake is at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on days when I'm not working, on days like today. I'll, like I'm, I'm just, I don't do it. Why? Because I don't need to. People call it breakfast because breakfast means break a fast. They ain't been on a fast long enough to break it. You ain't right before you went to bed, then you get up eating. You're breaking a fast. You ain't breaking nothing. You just continue. You should call it continuation. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, so I, so, so, so I changed how I thought. I'm, I, I still like to eat a lot of the stuff I eat. I just eat in a smaller window. So what I do is I make a protein shake at lunchtime. I'll have some snacks during the day, and then I'll eat dinner, and I'm good. Okay. What am I saying? I change the way I think about it, and when I change how I think about it, change what I do about it. When I change what I do about it, change what I get from it. In what? Everything in life. Okay, cool. So I go faster, go back over here. So there's, when you understand that being is the activity, uh, being speaks to my identity, doing speaks to my activity, having speaks to my property. Lastly, there's a gap. All of us have a gap. Everybody say a gap. There's a gap between in my, there's a gap in my identity, there's a gap in my activity, and there's a gap in my property. The gap is the difference between who I am and who I could be. This would be if you're no, nothing you can be, this is if you're everything you can be, none of, none of us are either one of those. Most of us are somewhere down here. We're being a, an nth of what we could be. So how do I fill this gap in my capacity to be? I fill the gap in my capacity to be with this thing called intentionality. Intentionality is one of the most, like be, learning to become hyper-intentional is one of the most imp important skills I've ever learned in my life. It's my hyper-intention to things I pre-decided are important that makes all the stuff in my life that works, work. Because there are only two things that I can focus on. I can either focus on intention or I can focus on distraction. Most people spend most of their waking hours focus on distraction to anesthetize themselves from the pain that's in their life because they've never focused on intention. Is that too tough? I ain't, being, I ain't trying to be mean. I love y'all. I'm gonna smile when I say it. And so, so what we have to do is we have to stop like trying to neutralize the pain with Netflix and neutralize the pain with, pain with alcohol and neutralize the pain with drugs and nu neutralize the pain with sex and neutralize the pain with and neutralize the pain with and neutralize the pain with and neutralize and we neutralize we try to neutralize the pain and it just keeps coming back why does it keep coming back it keeps coming back because we're not hyper intentional we can't we can't look at something in our lives that's there because we were intentional about it yesterday we, have, we haven't become hyper intentional about the input and so therefore the output is just what we get Okay, well, how do I fill the activity gap? I fill the activity gap with ingenuity. By the way, ingenuity means that I'm going to do, I'm going to attempt a different approach when the last approach stops, when, when I find out the last, I'm going to do a couple iterations in one approach. If it don't do anything, I'm going to go, oh, no, no, that ain't the one. I need to go find something else, right? There's some things, there's some bolts that you can take out with an adjustable wrench, but some of them need an impact wrench. For those of you who are mechanical, you'll get that. The rest of y'all, just, just nod your heads and smile. Okay. <laughs> How do we increase our property? Well, when we increase these, this automatically happens, but we do this through intensity. And You know what's really interesting? So many people are intense when they, need, when they should relax. I won't even say they should relax. Their life would be better off if they just relaxed. People become intense when they would be better off relaxing, and they become relaxed when they would be better off being intentional, being intense. And I'm going to tell you something. I was hyper-intentional, hyper-intense when I was broke. I was happy when I was broke, but don't forget this. I was not happy that I was broke. And I was so not happy that I was broke that I was both intentional and intense about creating wealth.
And now that we've created some wealth, some level of wealth, it's not, I mean, we ain't, I ain't Bill Gates rich, but, you know, I don't necessarily have to be, but I'm doing all right. You know, my grandbaby's richer than I was when I was 40, and she's four. You say, what's your point? My point is, if that level of intention and deciding what you're going to do with the waking hours of your life so that the sleeping hours of your life can be so much more peaceful. If you want to change any outcome in your life, change how you think about it. Tear out all that old thinking, put in some new thinking. You'll be blown away. My brother-in-law was down here a couple weeks ago. And um, I taught a lesson, and I'm going to end with this. I taught a lesson about one of the reasons our business grows is because I understand that in business, the objective is not cash accumulation. My financial objective is not cash accumulation. My, final objective, my financial objecti objective is cash flow. And I, I said, most people think of money as a pool to be viewed instead of as a tool to be used. And so they want to get a bunch of it in a pile in an account somewhere so they can look at it and say, oh yeah, I got this money. I don't want to do that. I want, to, I want it to be a pool, I want it to be a, a tool to be used. In Israel, you got the Sea of Galilee up north and you got the Dead Sea down south and you got the River Jordan that runs down. And there are fish that are living in the Sea of Galilee. We know because Peter and them, they were catching them fish back in the day. They still fishing there, right? There's fish in the River Jordan. Ain't no fish in the Dead Sea. Why? Because if they got down there, they would die. Why? Because it's the Dead Sea. Okay. You say, what's your point? Why is it the Dead Sea? The reason the Dead Sea is dead and the Sea of Galilee is li uh, living is because the Dead Sea only has an inlet and has no outlets. But the Sea of Galilee has an inlet and an outlet. Until you realize that your money, in order for it to grow, it has to flow. And in order for it to flow, it needs an inlet and an outlet. And it's so amazing to me because a good friend of mine, David Mitchell, I was talking to him one time. I said, David, how many employees do you have, bro? And at the time, I may have had two. He's like, I don't know, 60 or 70. What? Like, bro, doesn't that make you nervous? He's like, nah. Charlotte and I, we've been praying for years that the Lord would give us a business so we could employ Christian families so they could feed their babies. I'm like, who thinks like that? People who understand, that's who thinks like that. And I know, literally, for every person on our team, and we have like 20-something people on our team, for every person on our team, and our payroll is not little. It's, I mean, it's not ginormous. It's six figures a month. Our payroll ain't little, right? For every time I've hired somebody, our income has gone up. Our revenue, business revenue has gone up. Why? Because it's not a pool to be viewed. It's a tool to be used. And I'm telling you, if you will adapt some of these ideologies and change your mind about finances, about fitness, and about your relationships, if you will start thinking of it from a God perspective instead of a world perspective, it will change your life for the rest of your life. That is going to be the greatest transformation you will ever have. Renew your mind. Tear out the old. Install the new. And the interesting thing about the new is the new is so old it's eternal. It's just new to you. It's a new way for you to do. Hope that blesses you. The word of God is real. Stay blessed by the best, my people. Peace out, Cub Scouts. We'll see you in the next video.